All right. Well, uh, good morning, and let's um, let's begin. Um, let me uh, just start off with a quick review. I'm just going back a couple of days. Uh, going back to gradient descent. So gradient descent is this iterative optimization uh, method where we are trying to find the location where um, you know the values of some kind of vector or whatever it will be will create the uh, minimum value of a, a function. So we have some kind of function f. It takes uh, as its argument going in is a, a vector of values and we're trying to find you know whatever set of values that go into that vector that's going to minimize that thing. And so um, the way uh, gradient descent works is you just start at some arbitrary location, doesn't really matter where, and you calculate the gradient and you take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. So here's this question, you know, if we start at some location w at time t0, okay, how do we select our no next location w at time t equals 1? And, uh, and the answer is this, you just kind of type, take w at your current location and you subtract off gamma or lambda or whatever, gamma times nabla f or the gradient of the function at your cur current location of w. And so basically we're just taking a step backwards. So we look at which way is uphill and then we take a step backwards and that gets us closer downhill. Right? And we just keep doing this over and over and over again. And so by taking directions in the opposite of what is uphill, we're going to be taking steps downhill. And, uh, and eventually, we'll reach the bottom. Okay, At least a local minimum. It's not gradient descent, just like a bunch of other algorithms, is not guaranteed to converge. So no, there's no guarantee that you're going to end up at a global minimum. Um, it's just... We're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping it converges, and we're hoping it, it gets us there. But um, generally, it'll get you to a local minimum. But again, uh, we saw some examples where maybe the gamma was too big, and it started uh, bouncing around, and um, uh, you know, diverges, doesn't converge, things like that. That that kind of stuff can happen too. So that's gradient descent, and uh, one kind of neat application, or I guess uh, what gradient descent allowed us to do is to really kind of uh, solve or figure out solutions or um, optimal settings for neural networks. And so, um, you know, neural networks, <laughs> this is not a required, uh, I guess, piece of learning for this class. If you look at the course description for 102B, um, there's certain topics that you have to cover. Uh, as a professor, th things you have to cover in 102B and topics that you are not required to cover. And so neural networks is one of these topics that we are not required to cover. However, um, I think they're pretty neat. And I don't know if you've, as an undergraduate student, if you guys take any other classes that cover neural networks. So, um, so this, you know, we'll take, we'll spend maybe about a week on the topic of neural networks, just, you know, one out of our 10 weeks. Um, and it's just going to be a very, very, very brief introduction to this concept of neural networks. Um, but my hope is that uh, you'll learn something, it'll be interesting, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I always kind of <laughs> say, you know, there's, there's a lot of good information out there. And so um, these are some uh, playlists uh, that exist on YouTube that talk about uh, neural networks. Um, in, in particular, uh, this playlist, it's, a, it's several years old now, um, but, uh, but it covers some videos um, and there's a very kind of simple example that, uh, that the author actually kind of um, uses like numbers and things and, and we feed it through. And so. Um, so my lectures are based uh, largely, I, I copy the same example from, uh, from this playlist. Also, uh, another channel that, uh, that I highly recommend to everybody, 3Blue1Brown, I recommended his linear algebra 
um, series of videos, uh, but he also has a series on neural networks as well that I also highly recommend. Okay, um, so neural networks um, sound fancy. They've actually been around for quite a while. Um, it first started being uh, worked on in the 1970s, 1980s, so what's that, 40, 50 years ago, okay? But um, really gained a lot of popularity in, say, the last decade. Uh, and a lot of uh, the advancements um, in neural networks have kind of um, advanced our ability to create these AI systems. So basically, all of these large language models Things that power things like ChatGPT and you know whatever uh, Copilot and all of that, those at its heart are just really big neural networks. Just really, really big neural networks that have ingested lots and lots and lots of data. We're talking um, billions of connections and weights um, to kind of uh, power that. Uh, here we are going to just create the simplest kind of neural network, which is the uh, fully connected forward feed neural network. And we're going to create just a tiny, tiny, tiny one with maybe like a couple dozen connections. So just a few nodes and a, and a few connections. Actually, our, the first one in our example will have uh, a total of, what, uh, six nodes and like nine connections or something like that. So a really, really, really tiny thing. But at its heart, uh, it's going to be matrix operations, gradient descent, and the thing can be uh, just kind of grown. You can just scale it up. And so instead of just having a few nodes, you can have hundreds of nodes or millions of nodes. And instead of just having a cup, one layer, you can have, you know, hundreds of layers. And, um, and then that will yield, you know, kind of billions of connections and, uh, you know, a, a deep neural network, all right? Um, at its core, you can think of a neural network as a function, okay? In that something comes in, it does some calculations, and then something comes out, right? That's basically what a function does. Any kind of function you write, you say, all right, here are the inputs, x1 and x2. We're going to multiply it. We'll square this thing. We'll add this thing, something, something, something. It does some calculations. And then it says, and thus, your output is this. Thus, the sum of squared errors is, you know, this. It, you know, we take the input of x and y and w, and then it does some calculations, and it says, here, here your sum of squared is that. And the neural network is basically... Um, a way for us to design a function, okay? And the inspiration behind the neural network is the, where this neural thing comes from. It's kind of the, uh, like, you know, you study the brain, and, and inside your brain you've got all of these neurons, and the neurons are all kind of connected to each other um, by synapses and axons and whatever, and that's, that's how we learn, right? Like, you have these brain cells, these neurons, and then when you actually, quote, learn something, it's like your brain is creating a connection. And, um, but it takes effort and, and work, and that's why I always say the struggle, you know, when you struggle through your homework and whatnot, it's a good thing because then your brain is going to uh, try to uh, make, your, make it easier next time by creating additional connections, and, and that's how we learn things. Okay? And so in the biological brain, what happens is you know, there's these little electrical impulses, and it goes and it goes into one part of the one neuron, and depending on that neuron and the electrical impulses it receives, it might activate and then send out more electrical impulses to other neurons and things like that, right? And this is happening, you know, uh, millions of times per second, billions of times per second, and just like little little electrical impulses just flashing around um, there, okay? And, um, and in this kind of neural network that we're making, this artificial one, uh, we have these little, basically these nodes that are little functions, little numeric values come in, and depending on that node and the function and basically the numbers coming in, it might, quote, activate and send out an 
you know, different different value to another thing. And so, um, just as a very very sim simple and silly example, and this is not really a realistic data set at all because I only have three observations here. But um, as a very simple example, we're going to have uh, x the input be a matrix with two columns. And the output of our entire network, our entire function, will just be one variable. So we've got y, and it's a column of one value. Okay, and so um, so here, just to kind of give these things names or whatever, we'll call the first column uh, the hours of sleep, and then the second column will be the hours spent studying, and the output will be someone's exam score. Um, and again, we only have three observations here, and this is just to keep everything super, super simple, but perhaps in a real data set, you might have hundreds of rows or thousands of rows or millions of rows, depending on um, what, your, what your data uh, look like, right? So uh, I was listening to a, a, a story about uh, you know these AI large language models, and they've basically read all of the English text that exists on the internet, kind of, you know, they they read like all of the English text on Wikipedia, and that has that's part of the data that has gone into training its inter, you know, neural network and stuff. So we're talking huge amounts of things, and and here we have this very kind of toy type data set where we have just three rows of input, but but still, it we get the structure, okay. Um, so all neural networks they start with some kind of input layer, they end with an output layer. Um, our input matrix X has uh, two columns to represent um, each column representing kind of the um, uh, the the var variable um, in the uh, the input X. Okay, the output has one variable, the exam score. So the output layer just has one node, and a neural network will also have basically like one or more hidden layers. Um, and uh, and so for our example, we'll have a hidden layer with three nodes, okay? Um, and that's just an arbitrary choice, and I just chose three because it's a nice small number. <laughs> um, but uh, but you could have you know two uh, two nodes, three nodes, four nodes, a hundred nodes, a thousand nodes in that hidden layer if you want, okay? And then again, um, here I just have one hidden layer, so we're going to go from input layer, hidden layer, output layer, okay? Um, you could have more than one hidden layer. But this is basically what our network looks like. So we have two nodes in the input layer, one node for hours of sleep, one node for hours of study, three nodes in the hidden layer, okay? Uh, they, these have no labels, okay, in terms of like what they mean. So that's, that's one thing about neural networks is that these nodes on the inside, we don't know, they don't have any kind of meaning, okay? The input layer, sure, there's meaning there. And then the output layer, there's there's meaning. This is going to be our test score. But this is our structure. So we have two nodes at the input layer, three nodes at the hidden layer, one node at the output layer. And basically, every node from one layer has a connection to every node in the next layer. So x1, there's a connection to this layer, or, or this node, connection to this node, connection to this node. x2 has a connection to this node, this node, and this node. So you can see there's six arrows going from uh, the input layer to the hidden layer, which makes sense because there's two times three, six. Okay, and then here we have three connections going from the hidden layer to the output layer, three arrows, um, in, in total three connections. Three times one gives us that. So we're going to have a total of nine connections for us to figure out. Is that all right as far as the, uh, the structure here? Um, you know, deep learning, large language models, all of these things, um, they're basically the same kind of thing as this, just instead of three nodes here, imagine a thousand, okay? And then, you know, the input layer instead of just two inputs, again, thousands, all right? So if you have a thousand nodes in the input layer, a thousand nodes in the hidden layer, that's one million connections, right? A thousand by a thousand. And then instead of just one hidden layer, maybe you have a hundred layers, maybe a thousand layers, okay? Um, and that's that's just basically these, what what a deep learning network or these large language models are is just 
many, many, many layers, many, many, many nodes in each one, okay? And if you have a very big thing, it becomes incredibly powerful, all right? And so, um, uh, yeah, the kind of the most exciting things are things like ChatGPT, but it's also what powers um, all of our kind of image recognition. And this seems like old news now, <laughs> but the idea, I don't know if, if you just think for a moment, right? Now you can like take a picture with your phone and then later you can like search your images and say like um, cat and your phone will go through the pictures that you have taken and show you the pictures that have cats in them, okay? Which I think is totally amazing because it's not, there's no, uh, if you think about what a picture is, it's just like colored, it's just a, a grid of uh, numbers. Each number represents like how bright or how dark a pixel is. And based on just uh, a number that says this pixel is bright and this pixel is dark and this pixel is bright and this pixel is dark. And if you just think about that, it's able to say, oh yeah, this image contains a cat. This image contains a tree. This image uh, oops, is, is something something else, right? Um, you know, the, even just like you get a shopping app, right? Like a you download like the Amazon or the Target app and you take a picture of a product and it's able to like identify <laughs> what what product that is. You can just take the picture of the front. You don't even have to like look at the barcode and it's able to identify it, which if you think about it, it it's like amazing. It, now, because it just exists on our phone these days, we just go, oh yeah, you know, that's technology and stuff. But if you think about the engineering and the thought that goes into like creating something like that, it's really impressive. Um, Basically, all of our self-driving cars and stuff, that there, there's a lot of kind of hiccups as far as self-driving cars are because um, it's, it's other people. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the problem um, is uh, if, if all the vehicles on the road were self-driving cars, I think it would be easier. But because people are also driving and the car has to, self-driving car has to like be able to predict what other vehicles are going to do on the road. It's a lot trickier just because people are not as predictable as machines. But anyway, so a lot. I don't know if we'll ever get to fully self-driving. Um, but well, I'm, not ever. But it'll. It, there's a lot of hiccups there. But but all of that's kind of you know powered here. Uh, this is like an old video. Let me see if this does this link even work. Oh, there's. So this is. I guess six years ago already, but you know here the it's just taking in this live video feed and it's analyzing every pixel and it's kind of able to identify which pixels correspond to vehicles and which pixels correspond to people and which pixels are this is a bus and this is you know just some kind of object there. Um, really powerful stuff. Again, um, as far as our class goes, we're not we're not going to be looking at hundreds of layers we're looking at at this okay but it's the same idea you just make your matrices bigger okay um, that that's all we're gonna do um, so neural networks really good for this kind of predictive performance really good for kind of producing outputs that are impressive uh, really bad for interpretability okay even on this very simple network we have these three hidden layers and you're gonna get little uh, coefficients for each of these arrows and stuff we have no idea what any of these things mean, okay? Versus like linear regression, every um, beta coefficient has an interpretation, right? It's basically, hey, if x1 goes up by one, we predict its impact on y hat to be whatever beta one is. So if the number of square footage in the house goes up by one, we expect the value of the house to go up $300. It's a, it's a very clear kind of interpretation when you have linear regression. Neural networks, we have no idea. What does this node represent? I have no idea. What does this node represent also? We have no idea. Um, you might get general ideas. It's, it's a little bit like neuroscience. If you, if you open up someone's brain, okay, or cut open, and then you say, hey, we, we have a microscope. What does this one particular neuron do? We have no idea, okay? 
and we can show pictures of cats and stuff and see what part of the brain lights up, okay, and we can get a nice idea, but what does this one node neuron do? We don't know, right? If I take a knife and I cut away this one little piece of the brain, what an impact is it going to have? We have no idea, right? But obviously, that's a, <laughs> you, you don't want to just be cutting chunks of someone's brain away because we know something terrible could happen. But we have no idea. We have no idea what this particular part of the brain is. And then, j again, you know, we have these huge things, and someone says, well, tell me how the algorithm works. And, and our answer is, we don't know. Why did YouTube recommend this video with such accuracy, okay? You're like, I was watching this, and I went to this web page, and now I'm getting these videos in my feed that actually like speak to me and stuff, and it's like a little bit eerie and scary. How does that work? We don't really know. We just know, like, okay, we've set up a network. It's good. It's good at making predictions and stuff, okay? And then someone says, well, why am I also getting recommended these, like, views with kind of like weird viewpoints and you know controversial stuff also and and we're asking like hey can we tweak the algorithm so it doesn't do stuff like that and it's tricky <laughs> it's like can you go into someone's brain and tweak it so they don't have you know these intrusive thoughts and the answer is like no it's not that easy it's not that easy okay you, there's not just some knobs that you can just twist and turn on someone's brain, and there's not just some knobs that you can twist and turn on a neural network. Once it's trained, it's 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 tricky. So not not good for interpretability of how how each of these things work. Still a mystery. Okay, let me give you your first view quiz answer. First answer is the letter C. C as in cat. C as in cat. Okay, um, so going back to our network, uh, this is our picture, two, two uh, nodes in the input, three nodes in the hidden layer. And so we have six connections between the hit input layer and the hidden layer, and we have three connections between the hidden layer and the output layer. Okay, And so when we talk about we're going to train our neural network or we're going to train our model, what that comes down to is what are the numbers that we should use for these nine connections. So each of these connections will have a number, a weight, and I guess very, very loosely you can think of this as how important or how much influence does this node have on this node is kind of the weight, right? And, um, and so training our model consists of figuring out the weights of these connections, okay? It's just like when you think of linear regression and if you have, you know, six variables, you're going to have six beta coefficients, maybe a, a seventh for an intercept or something like that. And uh, and training your linear regression thing is just estimating the coefficients of those betas. Okay. And similarly, now we have nine coefficients, nine weights, one for each of these arrows. And training is just figuring out what is the best combination of weights to use. Okay. And for a large language model or a big deep learning network, you have billions of these connections. And a well-trained thing is figuring out the exact set of values that give good performance. And so um, this is uh, going to be done. Uh, here I have used uh, some notation to label every single one of these connections. Okay, So basically the subscripts represent the node that it's coming from and the node that it is going to. So this one, W11, means it's coming from node 1, going to node 1. Um, this arrow right here is W21, indicating it comes from node 2, goes to node 1. Here you can see, going into here, we have W12 and W22. This is going from node 1 to node 2 going from node 2 to node 2, going from node 1 to node 3 is W13, going from node 2 to node 3 is W23. All of these exist in the first set of connections, so they all have the superscript 1 to indicate that they are in, because um, if you think about like the set of arrows, this is our first set of arrows, this is our second set of arrows. So this is um, W superscript 1, connection 1, 1. This would be W superscript 1, connection 2, 1, okay? Over here, this is our second set of arrows. 
So we have W superscript 2 to indicate that it's in our second set of arrows. And it's going from node 1 to node 1, so it's going to be W11. Here I've got W super 2 subscript 21. And here I've got W superscript 2 subscript 31. Okay, is that all right as far as the notation for labeling each of these things? Okay, so we could arrange all of these. Um, uh, connections or these these weights into two matrices. Our first matrix, our first weight matrix is going to be big W superscript 1 and you can see those six connections. So I've got W11, W12, and W13, W21, W22, and W23 arranged in uh, this matrix that's two by three. Two, two rows, one for each lay, uh, node in the uh, input layer and three columns, one for each node in the hidden layer. Okay, And then the second set of arrows here is going to be in uh, big, uh, big W superscript 2, w, the W2 matrix, um, and we have three rows, one for each node in the hidden layer, and one column, one for each node in the output layer. And so we have W11, W21, and W31, all with superscript 2. Okay, So that's the notation for uh, how we're going to label each of these things. So how do we um, use these weight things to go from our input values x to our output value y? Okay, This part is known as forward propagation. It's going to say, all right, if you have some kind of values in your x matrix, okay, so our x matrix has n rows and two columns, okay, so our toy data set, we just have three rows and two columns, but in general, you might have many more rows. So you're going to have n rows, two columns in our input matrix. We're going to multiply that by our first weight matrix, which is two rows and three columns. So when you do an n by 2 multiplied by a 2 by 3, the output is going to be n by 3. And we're going to call the output um, z2, okay? Just arbitrary kind of choice for a thing. And so you can see, you know, this first row kind of represents the values you get for your first observation, but you're going to get three values, uh, you know, one for each node here. Okay, so we're going to get um, basically for the first observation, we have x1, x2 multiplied by w11 and w21, and that's going to go into z1 here. And then for the second node, uh, we have, you know, x, um, x1 and x2 multiplied by w12 and w22, and then for a third node, we have x1 and x2 um, multiplied by W13 and W23, okay? And that's just for the first observation. This happens again for the second observation, so on and so forth down to the nth observation. So the output is going to be n rows and three columns. Um, so we have uh, one column for node 1, a column for node 2, and a column for node 3. Okay, once you have your, um, your Z matrix, which is n by 3, we are going to apply what's called an activation function. Okay, so this is just some arbitrary function um, to decide whether this node should, quote, activate or not, an activation function um, in each of the uh, elements in Z. Um, so this does not uh, change the shape of the matrix Z, only the values inside, okay? Um, all right, let me, <laughs> let me pause here for, before I keep going. Um, I'm going to use matrix notation, but I also want to say what we're doing is not strictly linear algebra, okay? Um, not yet, but in kind of a future lecture, we're going to be doing some operations that are not, they're not, it's not linear algebra, okay? It's like cheating. <laughs> but the matrix notation gives us a convenient notation for doing a lot of these operations in mass because when you do matrix multiplication you're multiplying things together and you're adding them together and um, and we don't have to kind of I could just write X times W equals Z and we know that what's happening is this and this and I don't have to write out every single operation here okay and so the matrix notation gives us a convenient notation for us to work but um, we're going to be doing some stuff that's not strictly linear algebra. There's like certain rules and stuff that you do in linear algebra and it just, it 
just doesn't quite work out in the same way. So I just want to kind of preface that, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it again when, when we actually encounter these things. Um, so here I'm going to apply a function to every element inside our Z matrix. So I'm going to get another matrix. Because I'm just doing it element-wise, my Z matrix is n rows, three columns. My output will also be n rows and three columns because I've just applied this function to, um, to every element inside Z. Okay, And we're going to call that uh, A. Now, what function do we use? Okay, um, We're going to use what's called the sigmoid activation function. Um, and there are all kinds of choices. This is, I guess, also known as the logistic activation function. Um, basically, you just do 1 plus e to the negative t, and you, get, you end up getting this kind of logistic curve um, which takes some kind of value anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity and it outputs a value between 0 and 1. When you plug in 0, when you plug in 0 you get 1 over 1 plus 1 and, uh, and that becomes 0. 0.5. If you plug in negative infinity now you get 1 plus e to the positive infinity which is going to be 1 over infinity and so that's something that uh, approaches 0. And then if you plug in, um, you know, positive infinity or just any number really bigger than say six or ten or something like that, now you get one plus e to the a really small uh, e to the negative something. So it's going to be one plus a tiny number, almost zero, and you're going to get one over just about one. And so that that approaches asymptotically up there, and this is kind of the curve there. So this is kind of a, a logistic curve. You've seen it before in logistic regression because you that's basically what you do in logistic regression. That's one possible activation function. There's a whole bunch of other activation functions that you can do. I mean, uh, the identity function is just don't do anything to it. Just just leave it as such. Um, and But um, this is kind of a, a, a popular function historically. Okay, historically uh, the sigmoid activation function was a popular function to be used. Um, I would say it has fallen out of favor. Uh, there's a few kind of computational things about the logistic or sigmoid activation function that has made it less popular today. And the more popular un uh, activation function is known as the uh, ReLU, the rectified linear uh, thing. Where is it? Right here. And it looks like this, basically 0 if it's negative and x when it's positive. Um, that's a more popular, computationally faster thing, um, and things like that. But again, uh, the sigmoid is, uh, was of important, uh, has historical importance, so that's what we'll go ahead and use. Um, it's also what's used in kind of the video series if you do watch that. Okay, so, um, so how does this work? We're going to, we take our x, we multiply it by our first matrix w, we get our set of z's. Then we apply that activation function to every element in Z to get our A matrix. So A has n rows and three columns. Okay, And now we're going to multiply it by our second weight matrix, W, which is 3 by 1. And so if you think about this, n by 3 times a 3 by 1 is going to yield an n by 1 matrix. All right, And so even though this looks big, this is just one value because we're basically adding this and adding this and adding this. So you know, A11 and W11 plus A12 times W21 plus A13 times W31, those add up to just one single value. So this output is just one column of values. And those are going to be, um, that's going to be our uh, Z3 matrix, okay? N rows, one column. And then finally, we are going to apply an activation function to each element in Z, okay? And that's going to be our predicted values, y hat. So uh, all together, we take our input x, n rows, two columns, multiply it by our first weight matrix, and we get uh, a matrix z, z, n rows, three columns. We apply an activation function to each element in z, element-wise. So that uh, is uh, matrix A2, n rows, three columns. We're going to take that, multiply that by our second weight matrix, um, W2. Okay, three rows, one column. That produces uh, a matrix uh, that's n by one, and we're going to apply an activation function to that. 
and that produces our outputs, our y hats. So this is how we go from our input values x, and we take our kind of the weights in w1 and w2 to produce the output values y hat. Okay, so in summary, y hat is just the output of a function, and you can think of it as you know activation function applied to the activation function applied to x times w1, that result times w2. So you can kind of compress it all into this, but I think it's easier to think of it sequentially as starting at x, multiplying it by this, applying your activation functions, multiplying those outputs, and then applying your activation functions again. So think of it, I think it's easier to think of it sequentially rather than just one big uh, function. But if you, you can treat it as just one big function, and when you read functions, generally you always start at the most innermost thing and you read your way outwards. Okay, is that all right as far as the forward feed here? Okay. Um, this, uh, the video and my network as it appears now does not have what's called bias terms. Bias terms, you can also, th you can think of them as just kind of like intercepts. So, so right now I just have like slope coefficients. It's not exactly sl slope coefficients, they're, they're W uh, weights, but sometimes you want to add a constant to these things. Um, and th those are called bias terms. So bias terms are like, <laughs> I don't like the use of the word bias here just because bias comes with a lot of like negative connotation. I, I feel like it feels like, oh, our, our thing is, it's basically we should just include like, I don't know, I would just call them constant additive terms, but they are, they are known as bias terms, okay? Um, and so basically what we could do is also just add a constant to any of these kind of nodes and this will just, this has the effect of just sliding that, you know, that activation function, that sigmoid activation function, it just slides it left or right, okay? So when you add a thing, it's basically just sliding it left or right and that just gives you basically another kind of uh, that gives the model a little, another knob that it can use to kind of fine tune and adjust the, the outputs, okay? Because at the end of the goal, it wants to figure out what are the Ws it should use, and if we include biases, what are the um, bias terms, the B constant terms that it should use so that the outputs of Y hat are as close to the actual values of Y as possible. Because that's our ultimate goal is to shrink the difference between our predictions and the actual values so that the performance is good. So, um, so if you do this, um, you would add a, um, a set of bias terms here, okay? Now, this is where, <laughs> this is why I say it's very important to write the dimensions of each of your matrices um, below or uh, below each matrix here. Okay, wait, hang on. I have to give you, I've only given you one answer so far? Okay, let me give you your second answer. Oh, shoot, what day is today? Today's Wednesday? Okay. <laughs> it's D. D is the second, second answer. D. D as in dog. Okay, um, so you know, if I didn't tell you anything, you would just go, oh, okay, we'll do X and we'll do, multiply by W and then we'll add B. But then you would run into these this dimension mismatch problem, okay, or just things don't quite add up correctly. And so um, here, X times W is going to be N by 3. Our bias terms, okay, so right now I just have my bias terms. Um, uh, my gathered into just this kind of uh, B1 and B2 and B3, okay? And I need to add this somehow. So right now I, I also have this N by 3 matrix, okay? So if you think about what N by XW is, okay, um, it's N by 3. And I need to add basically my, oh, sorry, the colors are hard to read, um, but I need to add my uh, B terms, okay? But I can't just add it like this. 
what I have to do is I want basically this first B1 added to every single value in the first column. I want the B2 to be added to every single value in the second column. And I want B3 to be added to every single value in the third column. So basically, I just need a column of ones, and I need to transpose this B1 so it's sideways. Okay? And so I'm going to do J times B1 transpose to get this. And now, now these things multiply and add up. So this will be n by 3, this will be n by 3, and I can add them together. And now I get an n by 3 here. I called uh, this column of ones, I just arbitrarily called it J. Um, that's just kind of the, <laughs> the name of the matrix I gave it to a column of ones. Um, it's, it's not I, okay? I is, the, uh, is an identity matrix. Uh, it's a square matrix with zeros and one, ones going down the diagonal. We're not doing that. We're, uh, we want to kind of replicate this column to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, replicate these values down a column here, okay? So that's, that would be our bias terms. We would do something very similar for the second weight, um, second, uh, I'm sorry, in the output layer, we have a node here, and I just have one term. It's just B1, 2, okay? But uh, but we'll do it uh, here as well. Uh, here I have B2 transpose. It seems silly because it's just a constant, so I don't really actually need to transpose it in this case. But if you had another net network where you had multiple layers in the output, you then you'd want to transpose it, okay? You'd want to transpose it there. And so you would do something like this, and basically, if you think about what A times W is, this is uh, N rows, one column, and we just want to add B1 to every single value in, uh, down that column. And so this is, this is what we have here. All right, does that feel okay as far as kind of the, the matrix uh, multiplications? And so the yield, end result here, if you include these constant terms, these biased terms, looks something like this. You have your inputs X, times your first matrix weight matrix W plus um, basically your uh, constants in the B, uh, B matrix. Um, but in order to get the dimensions to work, you need to multiply by J. That's going to yield an N2, uh, N by 3 matrix, Z2. Again, we just apply an activation function to each element in there. That gives us A2. We take A2, multiply by our second weight matrix, add those constants just down the column. That gives us Z3. We'll apply our activation function to that to yield our um, predictions y hat. Okay, so this is, so far is just this idea of how do we go from our input values to a predicted value. And this is just the mechanism of you take this, you multiply it by this, you add a constant, apply an activation function, multiply it, add a constant, apply an activation function. And that yields your predictions. Okay, uh, what we want to do next, okay, uh, which we will cover in our next lecture, is now that we have a way to get predicted values, we want to measure our the performance of those predicted values. We want to be able to say, are these predicted values any good? Okay, and if I change one of these parameters, right? If I increase W11 by a tiny bit, or if I decrease W12 by a tiny bit or something, I'm going to get slightly different values. And if I get slightly different values, are those predictions better or worse? Right? So it's really important to know, like, if, if I do this, are things getting better or worse? Right? It's kind of like, um, I don't know, you go into a... Uh, uh, you go over to a, a friend's house or the, a house that you've never been to at the first time. You go into the bathroom and there's like a whole panel of light switches, right? And and you're like, you ha it takes a little experimentation, right? You like, what does this light switch do? Oh, it turns that light on. Okay, what does this light switch do? Oh, it turns these lights on. It turns the fan on and things like that. And and what is it that you want? Okay, you want maybe you want these lights or something, right? So we want to know like, okay, which which set of these kind of controls do I want to mess around with? Okay, except it's not just an on-off, it's like a knob. You can control, you know, this is going to go up or this is going to go down. Um, and so you have all of these things, you have all of these different <laughs> W terms that you can kind of mess around with, and you want to know, is your performance getting better? And so 
the, the way we're going to measure performance, pretty simple. We're just going to use the sum of squared errors. We're going to take our predicted values, y hats, whatever they are, and we'll just say how different are they from the actual values y. Okay, And so using the matrix notation, which again um, just keeps our, it provides a convenient notation for us to work with, we can just do y minus y hat transpose times y minus y hat. And this, this y minus y hat is the difference. It's going to be a vector of differences. And by doing it transpose times y minus y hat, you're going to be multiplying you know, a column vector and a row vector. All right, no, no, I'm sorry, a row vector and a column vector. And those multiply and add up to just a single scalar value, which is what we want. We just want a single scalar value, which gives us, OK, my number is getting bigger, so it's getting worse. My number is getting smaller, so it's getting better. Okay, and so that's gonna that's gonna be how we measure it. So you know, any one thing it might get better or worse, but overall we just kind of multiply all of those things, add them up, we get a single number, and this is gonna be our overall measure. Okay, um, it is a squared loss function. So what that means, okay, anytime you see squared loss, what that means is overall it's gonna uh, prefer a bunch of tiny errors than one big error. Okay, um, so squared loss always punishes uh, big errors much more heavily, and it punishes small errors much, much less. Okay, so anytime you see that, that's what's going to happen. So, um, so that's kind of uh, where we are headed. All right, um, we'll uh, wrap, wrap things up here, and, um, and we'll continue this on Friday.